Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. So I guess the question is, why church or is it relevant today or not relevant and what's been your experience? It should be relevant. I really do believe that. For me at least, uh, church isn't that relevant because I feel that just church in general and church in religion is just encouraging you to be a good person and do good things. It's, it's relevant. I don't think it's like the center of people's lives anymore. Hey, good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers and the various uh, variety of forms that that works in. I do want to say a very special Happy Mother's Day to the most incredible mother I know in this room. It's my wife, Melissa. Uh, you guys do me a favor and thank Melissa and all the, the hard work she does, not only in making me a, a better uh, man and, and husband and father, but hopefully a better pastor to you all. So thank you, Melissa. Hey, um, we are in the middle of our Why Church series, and I do want you to know a couple things. Number one, I believe that in this room right now, I want you to know that you're welcome here because I believe that you are part of God's plan for this church. It's not a mistake. Even if this is your first time here and we're welcoming you as a, as a guest right here on day one, I want you to know that, that there's a reason that you're here. You're part of what God's doing within this place, and I think it's super powerful as we're entering into this series called Why Church, we're in the middle of it right now. We're entering into like the second reason that we're offering today. And uh, we're going we're to talk about why church is important, whether or not you believe like we do, or whether maybe church or, or faith isn't something that's part of your experience. Regardless, we want you to, to hear why we think that church ought to be a part of your routine. And we're going to continue to explore that today. Uh, before we do, would you join me in a word of prayer? But Father, right now I hold in my hands a copy of the living Word of God, and I believe that in it, as we open it up together today, there is a just incredible, uh, it's an incredible source of the truth. And as we read it together today, Father, I pray that you would help us to, to hear from you. If there's anyone in this room that has a wall up or some sort of barrier that's going to keep them from hearing the truth from your Word and applying it to their lives, I pray that you would break down those barriers right now, God. God, I pray for each of us that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word this morning, that we would be uh, appliers, that we would be doers of the word, that we would take the truth that we hear today and apply it into our lives so that we can be more like you and more like your son. We pray this in Jesus' name together, we say, amen. Church, um, if you do me a favor, open up a copy of your Bible to Luke chapter 5. Uh, remember, bring your Bible to church with you. If you don't own a Bible, just grab the one that's in the chair uh, seat in front of you and grab, write your name in it and take it home with you. We want you to own a Bible, okay? So bring a copy of your Bible to church with you on Sunday mornings. We're going to be opening it uh, every Sunday. The, the teaching that happens at this church is all based on the truth of God's Word. So this is a really powerful tool. Uh, for those of you who are learning how to use God's Word, Luke Chapter 5, Luke is the third book of the New Testament, so it's about three-quarters of the way through the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke is the third book of the New Testament. And we're going to be in chapter 5 here in a moment. And while you're turning to there and finding Luke chapter 5, uh, this past weekend, my wife and I were able to go on a, a marriage retreat with our life group. So our life group went away together. It was a really cool time together. It was really powerful. And we heard this one thing that kind of was a, a repeating theme throughout the marriage retreat. And I wanted to teach it to you for two reasons. One, it's awesome. It'll help your marriage. Now, the second is it's going to apply to what we're talking about this morning. And essentially the truth was this, that all marriages, listen, if you're married in this room, all marriages are intentionally moving towards oneness 
or they are drifting towards isolation. So in other words, if you're not taking active steps to become closer with your spouse by not doing anything, you are drifting towards isolation no matter what. And I think that same truth applies to to church or to community in general. In fact, here's the way I would say it, is that if uh, all, all people are moving intentionally towards community or you are drifting towards loneliness. In other words, you have to be very intentional in your life to say, I want to enter into belonging. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. And if you're not intentional about doing that, and you're just kind of sitting there in in a boat on the water, your boat is going to not move accidentally towards community. It's going to drift towards loneliness. There's an author named Randy uh, Frazee who, who says the same thing, but in a different way. He says, people need to be involved in meaningful and constant community. Notice it says meaningful and constant community, or they will continue on indefinitely in a state of intense loneliness. And I want to ask you a question about loneliness and and ultimately uh, today's kind of reason why church. Reason number two is that belonging is better. And I think everyone inherently knows that belonging is always better than not belonging. Deep down in every one of us, there's a, there's a desire to be a part of something bigger and better than yourself. You want to know, how do I fit in? How does my life uh, kind of, part, how do I participate in the bigger picture of what's happening? Where do I belong? Right? And, and ultimately, the reason we want to invite you to be a part of church is that belonging into community is better than, than loneliness. And the crazy thing is that there's, loneliness is a growing problem. There's actually a research study that happens Uh, almost every year, and it's through Cigna Health and UCLA. They work together to create this study that they call the Loneliness Index, and it's just a study of Americans, and uh, it's a study that shows whether or not Americans are feeling more or less lonely as time goes on, and the the results are sad, to say the least. In fact, I want to share this with you if you, by the way, if you feel lonely or, or constantly feel lonely in your life, you're going to see here in a moment that you're not weird at all. In fact, almost 50%, so almost half the people interviewed as part of this survey report feeling alone or left out nearly all of the time. So in America, 50% of us experience loneliness nearly all of the time don't feel like they belong, don't know where their place is, don't feel like they have someone they can really be honest and real and open with. Another interesting thing from this study, it says that the feelings of loneliness are getting worse with each younger generation, even though that each younger generation claims to be more connected than ever before. So your young people, parents, listen to this, your young people are struggling with loneliness more and in a deeper way on average than you are. And here's uh, the the real sobering result of these statistics. They found that loneliness has the same impact on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Crazy, right? That this is a huge problem, a problem that many of us are struggling with, and that that feeling of loneliness, that, that experience of not belonging, actually affects the the overall lifespan of your life, the equivalent of if you were smoking 15 cigarettes a day. This is a really big problem, and it's one I want you to know that ACC is a big part of how we do church and how we connect people to one another and why we program the way we program. I want to show you a quote from Larry Crabb out of The Connecting Church. He didn't write this book. He wrote the foreword to the book, Uh, but here's what he says. It says, the future of the church depends on whether it develops true community. Say that word with me, true community. We can get by for a while on size and skilled communication and programs to meet every need, but unless we sense that we belong to each other with masks off, the vibrant church of today will become the powerless church of tomorrow. Stale, irrelevant, a place of pretense, 
Where sufferers suffer alone. Where pressure generates conformity rather than the Spirit creating life. That's where the church is headed unless it focuses on community. That's a really sobering quote, and it's a very interesting uh, realization that the church needs to be intentional about community. We need to be all, by the way, when I say the church, I'm not talking about the leaders. I'm not talking about, hey, Matt really needs to be thinking about this. I'm saying the church, right? We are the church. You make up the church, and we together as a body of believers, we need to be intentional about belonging. We need to be intentional about coming together and forming community. Otherwise, we will be unintentionally, we will be drifting towards loneliness. It'll happen over and over and over again. So what do we do with that? Now, what I want to do is, is give you a, a kind of a roadmap. If you are going to take a path from where you are right now towards belonging, what are the steps along the way? And step number one is simply this. You have to be present. You have to show up in order to belong. If you've ever been in a situation before, I hear often people say, you know, I don't want to go to that uh, event. I don't want to go to that thing. I don't want to be present at church because I just don't feel like I, I, I belong. And I want you to know that I feel like maybe you've put the cart before the horse, that and you, you need to be present. You need to be there before you can actually experience the belonging. You need to make sure to be there, to be present. If you would open, uh, you're already open to Luke chapter 5. Let's, uh, let's look there together, and I'm going to show you one of the most incredible examples of isolation and loneliness that's solved through being present in the Bible. Ma uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 12. It says, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Now, here's why that's important. To, to, for the fact that this man was covered in leprosy, we know kind of medically that he's been suffering from this disease probably for five years or more, okay? And as Jesus was walking into town, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. While he, or when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are, what's the next word? Willing you can make me clean. Here's why that word is so crazy important. This man, uh, without a doubt, has heard stories about a man who is present, a man who is in the area, who is able to heal disease and able to, 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 to do incredible miracles and is capable of all of these things. And there's no doubt that this man knows fully that Jesus is more than capable of doing it. You see, the man doesn't say if you are able, what does he say? He says, if you are willing. Essentially, what I think this man is saying in that moment is, Jesus, if you think I'm worth it, would you heal me? If you think my life has any value in it, I've given up believing in myself. Nobody wants to be around me. Nobody wants to touch me. God, if, I know you're able, but if you think that maybe my life has any value and it, I'm worthy of your time, would you, would you take this away from me? And then it goes on. But before I get to the, the continued part, I want you to understand what this man's life must have been like leading up to this point. If you uh, follow along on the screen behind me. In Leviticus chapter 13, we actually see what the life of a leper would have been like. In Leviticus 13, it says, those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out, unclean, unclean. As long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside of the camp. So essentially what we understand about this man who's been covered in these sores that's, that's suffering from leprosy probably for five years or more is that he is the epitome of, of understanding what loneliness feels like. Remember, leprosy is a, is, is, is a contagious disease that is passed along through touch. So this man, in order to keep everyone clean, if you are found to have this uncurable leprosy at the time, you had to 
purposely make sure you looked like a mess. You had to tear your clothes. And every time you saw someone alive, you had to yell out to them, leave me alone. You don't want to be near me. I, I'm unclean. And you had to yell out, unclean, unclean. This guy walked around. His life was completely changed because of leprosy. Now, given the cultural time and, and the likelihood, this man, uh, like I said, was probably sore for over five years. He probably had been married. He probably had his entire life turned upside down because of this disease. And he wasn't supposed to be touched. So in five years, no one had touched this man. And here's what we see in Luke 5, uh, 13 and 14. It says, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. This is really powerful stuff. I want you to know that in that moment, Jesus could have healed the man through a word. He could have said, you're clean. He could have offered a prayer. He could have picked up some dust and thrown it at him in his direction. He could have done whatever he wants. But Jesus says, not only... Are you, you know, this man is asking, are you willing? He says, I am willing, and he reaches out and touches him. I don't know if you've ever uh, heard of Max Licato. He's a, a pastor and an author. If you um, aren't really big into reading, I recommend many of his books because they're actually very easy to read. He writes in a way that's uh, kind of a storytelling sort of way of sharing truth. And I wanted to share with you one of his stories uh, out of one of his books. Now remember, we only have three verses about this man. We don't know a lot about his life. So Max Licato uh, kind of gave us a little bit to think about here. This is a story from the perspective of the leper. How many of you like a good story? All right. This is a story from the perspective of the leper. Here's what he says. Several weeks ago, I dared walk the road to my village. I had no intent of entering Heaven knows I only wanted to look again upon my fields, gaze upon my home, and see, perchance, the face of my wife. I did not see her, but I saw some children playing in a pasture. I hid behind a tree and watched them scamper and run. Their faces were so joyful and their laughter so contagious that for a moment, just for a moment, I was no longer a leper. I was a farmer. I was a father. I was a man again. Infused with their happiness, I stepped out from behind that tree and I straightened my back and I breathed deeply and then they saw me. Before I could retreat, they saw me. They, they screamed and they scattered. One lingered, though, behind the others. One paused and looked in my direction. I don't know and I can't say for sure, but I think, I really think she was my daughter. I don't know, I really can't say for sure, but I think she was looking for her father. That look that I saw is what made me take a step I took today. Of course it was reckless, of course it was risky, but what did I have to lose? He calls himself God's son. Either he will hear my complaint and kill me or accept my demands and heal me. Those were my thoughts. From behind a rock, I watched him descend a hill Throngs of people followed him. I waited until he was only paces from me, and then I stepped out. Master, I said. He stopped and looked in my direction, as did dozens of others. A flood of fear swept across the crowd. Arms flew in front of faces. Children ducked behind their parents. Unclean, someone shouted. Again, I don't blame them. I was a huddled mass of death. But I scarcely heard them. I scarcely saw them. Their panic I'd seen a thousand times. His compassion, however, I had never seen before. Someone, or everyone stepped back, except him. He stepped towards me. He stepped towards me. Five years ago, my wife had stepped towards me. She was the last to do so. 
Now he did. I did not move. I just spoke, Lord, if you can heal me. No, I said, Lord, you can heal me if you will. He had healed me with a word, I would have been thrilled. If he had healed me with a prayer, I would have rejoiced. But he wasn't satisfied with just speaking to me. He drew near me, drew near me. He touched me. Five years ago, my wife had touched me. No one has touched me since until today. I will. His words were as tender as his touch. Be healed, he said. Isn't that powerful? Just to, to understand what kind of loneliness this man must have been experiencing. And in the light of all the loneliness, in light of the fact that he knew he was not supposed to be present, he was supposed to be in isolation, he was supposed to be away, he was supposed to be shouting other things when he wasn't, in light of all that, he chose to find belonging by being present. When Jesus was coming towards him, he stepped out and he took a leap of faith and said, I'm just going to be here. I'm not going to miss this. Jesus ultimately said to him, I am willing. And what Jesus was really saying in that moment is, listen to me, you belong. You are worthy. You are worth it. And then he tells him to go to see the priest and to be declared clean so that as a public testimony, all of the community would know in that moment, I am restored. I belong. I'm worthy. I'm worth it. But see, this man chose to be present first. And I want to ask you, how many of you can relate with this man's story? Maybe uh, there's something, an actual physical ailment. Maybe there's something about your personality. Maybe uh, there's a, something in your history, like a, a divorce or something. And for whatever reason, you have told yourself or other people have been telling you that you don't belong. You need to remain in isolation for many of you, you're the one who's saying that to yourself. I don't, I'm not worthy to belong. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not deserving to be a part of community. I want you to know, just like in this story, listen to me, you belong here. You belong here. I don't care what anybody else has told you. I don't care what you've told yourself. I want you to know you belong. Here's the next step in the path to belonging. Not only do you need to be present, but you need to be authentic. You need to be willing to be real with other people. In fact, I, I'll go so far as to say you can't have belonging without authenticity. Think about that for a moment. You cannot belong without being authentic. Because here's the deal. If I walk into church on a Sunday morning and I pretend that everything's fine and I put a smile on my face and when people ask me what's going on in my life, I tell them what I think they want to hear instead of what's real, instead of what's true. If I walk into my life group and they say, what's going on, Matt? And I'm always like, oh, everything's great. When it's not. The person that's belonging in that moment is not me. It's the person I'm pretending to be. The truth is that you all, all of us long to belong, not just a, a fake version. We don't want to belong a, a fake version. We want to belong as the real us. We want to know that who we are, the actual things that are going on in our lives, the hurts and the hang-ups and the struggles and all the things that make us who we are, that that person belongs. And I want to tell you that when you're at, asking the question, why church? Because in this church, I don't know, I'm not going to answer for other churches, but I want you to know in this body of Christ, you belong. You can be real. You can come as you are. And you belong here. And you'll be loved here. Let's uh, flip over two chapters to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, here's another story, a true story. Uh, if you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to put these verses up on the screen, or maybe I am. All right, they're up on the screen. <laughs> Follow along with me. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home, and he sat down to eat. Here's a quick observation. This is one of the reasons that Jesus is so cool to me. Every time Jesus is invited over for food, he always says yes. Anyone else like that? You want me over? What is there food? Right? So Jesus is invited over to have dinner, and Jesus says yes. But notice in this it says that Jesus went to his home, 
and immediately sat down to eat. There was no special greeting that was customary. There was no, uh, let me wash your feet, which was very customary. There was no anointing him with oil, which was from a hospitality perspective, very customary. The Pharisee invited him over to his house, and then Jesus went over and they sat down to eat. The man skipped all of those things. Here's what I think was happening in that moment. Maybe, guys, you can relate with me. Have you ever been asked by your wife to hold her purse? You know what I'm talking about. You're out in public, and your wife says, here, can you hold my purse? Now, there's a couple different ways you can hold a purse. I could take my wife's purse and throw it over my arm like she does and walk around with it like that. I don't do that. (laughs) Here's what I do. I grab it, and I hold it in a way that it's not meant to be held, and I hold it about a foot away from my body. Here's why. I want everyone looking at me in that moment to know this isn't his purse. (laughs) This is his wife's purse. And here's what I think is happening in this moment with the Pharisee. The Pharisee is saying, there's something really special and incredible about this man named Jesus. There's something powerful about the miracles that he's performing. There's something amazing, and I want to get to know him, but I don't want to hold him so close that people think he and I are together. I'm going to invite him over and be like, hey, yeah, come on in, sit down. I'm going to hold you a foot away. Not being very real, not being authentic, putting on airs because he has other Pharisee friends with him who are maybe judging the invitation in and of itself. And in that moment, this Pharisee, this man, whose name is Simon, we're going to see here in a moment, is pretending. And then it says, when a certain immoral woman, I love this this phrase, it says a certain immoral woman. What I mean by that, or what what Luke means by that, is everyone knew who this woman was. She was not an unknown commodity in this community. Everyone knew this certain woman, and they knew that she was immoral. If you read other versions of the uh, the Bible, you'll see all different translations, but essentially she was a, a woman of the night. She was a prostitute. And everyone knew that. And a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. You know how much authenticity it would have taken for her to walk into this party and to sit down or to come in and and greet Jesus? She knelt before him at his feet, weeping. She's being super real here. Her, Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Essentially what's happening, notice uh, so far that Luke, every time he talks about the Pharisee, he calls him a Pharisee. Luke isn't using his name. Luke is, is labeling this man, and by the way, this man is used to that label. He knows uh, what labeling looks like. He's a pro at, pro at labeling people. In fact, you see in this verse, he's trying to put labels on Jesus and he's trying to put labels on this woman. He says, and if this man were a prophet, if I were to take my label maker, I, I probably couldn't put the word prophet on him because if he was, he would know that she already has a label on her of a sinner. He, he's, he's working in labels right now. So far, no one's using names. Everyone's using labels. And then it goes on. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. I love this. Okay, Simon so far, the the Pharisee, he's only thinking these things. And Jesus is Jesus. So it says that Jesus goes and answers what he's thinking. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Then Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. By the way, have you you noticed what Jesus calls the man? calls him Simon. Jesus uses the man's name. So far, he's the only one. 
Then the man says, uh, Jesus says, that's right. And then he turned to the woman. Here's really, I, w- I want you to try to picture this, this in your head, okay? Here's a story that, that there's this woman, and she's washing and crying and, and anointing Jesus' feet. And now Jesus is looking over at Simon and having a conversation with his thoughts, okay? He's answering Simon's thoughts. And then it says that Jesus turned and he looked at the woman. A woman who, by the way, I don't mean to be crass here, but probably isn't used to being looked at in the eye. A woman who, who no one really cares about her enough to just pay attention and give her, them, her their, their attention and, and look at her. And as he's looking at this woman in the eye, he's still talking to Simon. And here's what he says. Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. Remember, he's looking at this woman's face right now when he's saying these things. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. When Jesus, then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, they're still trying to label him, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. See, this woman enters into this story, and she is the epitome of real. She's completely authentic. In that moment, she is being her vulnerable self. While Jesus is sitting in a party with Simon the Pharisee, who is uh, the opposite of that. He's pretending to keep his distance. And then Jesus shares the story, and I want you to understand that the way you love is directly connected to how you understand your own forgiveness. Think about that for a moment. The way you love other people is directly connected to the way you understand that you yourselves are forgiven. And when you fully understand this as a church, it is going to change the way people are able to be authentic with you and real with you, and the way you're able to be authentic and real with other people. Because when you know that you are the biggest sinner that you know, when you understand that your life is messed up and that you are uh, desperately in need of a Savior, and that you are just on a journey just like everyone else, when you enter into authentic relationship, when you enter in and you're real with people and you, you open up and you're vulnerable and let people see the actual real you instead of the you you're pretending to be, That's one of the most important things in this process of belonging. You know, if you remember in uh, Acts, the end of Acts chapter 4 and the beginning of Acts 5, we we see the first recorded sin of the church. The church had been created, and people were selling their possessions and bringing it to share it with other people. And this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they went and they, they sold their property and they sold some land, they sold what they had, and then they secretly kept some of it for themselves. And then they brought the rest of it to the leaders of the church and they said, here's everything. Now in that moment, they weren't being authentic at all. They weren't being real. There was no order, by the way, for them to sell everything and give it all. They could have come and said, hey, we sold everything and, and we kept 10% and we wanted to bring the next 90% and give it here. They could have done that. They could have been real, but instead they put on errors. They pretended that they were bringing everything they had. They were making just a full sacrifice for the sake of the church. And if you read on in that story, it wasn't good for them. They both died. You see, being real and authentic is so powerful within the life of the church. And the, the, the thing I want you to really understand here is that being the kind of real and vulnerable that you need to be you're not going to be able to do that on a Sunday morning. You cannot be the kind of real and vulnerable that's necessary to belong into a community by only showing up here on a Sunday morning. In fact, we have life groups for that purpose. We have these small groups of people that meet all over this community that you can enter into. And in that community, 
You can be present and you can be fully authentic. You can pour out your heart. You can let people see the parts of you that are a little ugly, right? Here's what's going on in my life. Here's the thought I was thinking. Here's this. Here's that. And in that situation, it becomes appropriate and safe to be fully vulnerable because you're in a community of people who are going to love you for you and not the you that you think you need to show. You can't be a healthy version of authentic. You can't be a healthy version of vulnerable. You can't be a healthy version of known unless you're in a life group. I'm just going to say it. We did a survey, um, our our twice-a-year survey that we did, and in every single case, anytime someone within this church put a really low ranking for feeling like they belong at ACC, they also answered the question about whether or not they were in a life group in the negative. I hope you understand that correlation. When you join into a community, a small community called a life group, that gives you the opportunity to complete the second step. You need to be authentic. Here's a third thing I want to, uh, the third and final path to belonging. Not only do you need to be present, not only do you need to be authentic, but you need to allow yourself to be loved. And I, I want you to know that many of you are saying, hey, every time I've shown up and in my past when I got vulnerable and I, I poured out the real me to someone, they used it against me. They backstabbed me. They shared my secrets with other people. And that went terribly wrong. I don't want to be authentic with people because people stink, frankly. Right? If you've experienced that, I want you to know that at ACC, and myself specifically as the lead pastor of this church, the congregation I am working and trying my best to, to lead is that this would be a place where that doesn't happen. That when you enter into a life group, that when you enter into a community, that not only can you be present and authentic, but in light of both of those things, you're going to be loved. The way you walk in that door. But I also want you to understand that part of really loving someone is is seeing a better version of them and helping them walk in that direction. And the same is true in both directions, right? You see, we say that Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Your life group will love you just the way you are, but your life group is going to love you too much to let you stay a a weaker version of yourself when you could be a better version of you, more like Christ. If you turn back to Luke chapter 5, so turn back, we were in Luke 5, and then we moved to Luke 7. Back to Luke 5. There's a story of when Jesus calls Matthew to be one of his disciples. Now, Matthew's name, before he was a disciple, was Levi. And Matthew was a tax collector. And here's the story of Jesus calling him. It says, later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. Here's what happens. Tax collectors, by the way, were completely hated. They were considered scum. You're going to see that in the next verse we're going to read. They were considered worse than uh, the worst of sinners. Tax collectors were the worst. And Jesus walks up to a tax collector. He walks up to Levi and he says, hey, I love you. You want to be in my life group? It's essentially what's happening, right? He walks up to him and he says, follow me and be one of my 12. Come be with me. You belong with me. Come and be in my life group. And then as we keep reading in verses 28, by the way, Matthew hadn't belonged in a long time. It says, Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. As Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Again, Jesus shows up when there's food. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I don't come to call those who think they are righteous, righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. What Jesus is saying in this moment, again to the Pharisees who are judging and labeling people, he says, listen, I came so that when people are present and real, 
so I can love them. And, and Levi left, he just left all of his, his tax collecting stuff. He walked away from his career and he says, I want to be loved by you, Jesus. And he, he, I want to be, I want to belong. Many of you, by the way, just like Matthew, your source of belonging right now is you have a lot of power maybe where you work and you think you have a lot of people who follow you because they want to, but they follow you because they have to. Or you have a lot of money or Instagram followers and you find your sense of belonging in the wealth or, or in the, the following, the popularity that maybe you have. Maybe you find belonging in, in some sort of fame that people know you for something. But at the end of the day, the people just know that you're wealthy. They know that you're powerful. They know that, just like Matthew, they knew that he was wealthy. They knew he was powerful. And they did what he said, but he didn't really belong at all. When Jesus walks up to him and says, I love you, come hang out with me. That's powerful stuff. And I want you to know that we are a, a church that's made up of people, and people are messed up and broken. So we're going to get it wrong from time to time. You might experience a situation where you said, you know what, I, I showed up, I went to one of these life groups, and I was real, and I got hurt. I, I, want, to, I want you to know that we're working towards constantly growing and improving as a church, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. But you need to, you need to be present. You need to be willing to, to, to be authentic and real and then let the people of God around you, the church, love you. And just like Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Jesus has come into the church. He's walked into your life because he doesn't want to leave you the way you are. He loves you too much for that. He wants to help you change and get better and heal. And so should the people that you're doing life with in community. I know in my community, if I share something in my life that's going on, a thought, a pattern, or a process, something unhealthy, my life group, at least the, the guys in my life group, have permission to speak into my life and say, there's a, there's a, a better mat for tomorrow. Let's encourage and, and, and strengthen and empower and, and pour into God's word together and, and help you become the you that God wants you to be. So uh, we always finish with this thought, what now? What do we do with this? Like I said when I prayed, this is the living word of God. We opened it up. We read it together. Now we ought to ask ourselves, God, what do you want me to do with the truth? We have the story of the leper, the story of this certain immoral woman, and the story of the tax collector. What can I do with those real stories and how they relate to belonging and how can I apply it to my lives, to our lives? I want to say this. Um, at ACC, we can do everything we can to create an environment that allows you to belong. We can cover a whole wall that you see when you walk out of the auditorium that says you belong here. We can create life groups for you to belong in. We can know what you're missing and pray for you if you're not in those things. The only thing we really can't do for you is to have you actually step into community. We can create the, the, the perfect environment for you to do it, but it's a choice that you have to make to say, I long for this. I want this. I see value in it. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be real. I'm going to let the church love on me. So your what now I want to suggest is to be present, be authentic, and be loved in a life group. If you're not in a life group, you can change that today. You can fill out one of those connect cards. You might have already turned it in. Grab another one and check the box. I want to be in a life group. And we'll call you this week and help you find a life group that's perfect for your schedule, perfect for your location. We'll help you find a life group. If you want, you can go by our life group hub after service and you can sign up for a life group there. We have opportunities for you to take this next step. In Romans 5.8, it says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So I want you to know, you don't have to be good enough before you belong here. You don't have to uh, believe like we do before you belong here. You don't have to be a perfect mom who nails every craft on Pinterest before you belong here. You don't have to have power, wealth, or fame. You don't have to have hundreds of followers on social media. You don't have to have a clean past to belong here. Listen to this. You belong here pray together. God, I pray that you'd give us the courage to step into community. 
I know that this is a church that if the statistics hold true, that half of us in this room struggle to, to, to feel like they, they know where they belong, that are struggling with consistent feelings of loneliness. And we know that we have a path forward, that we can choose to be present here within the church, that we can choose to be real and authentic for the sake of growth in the church, and we can let the church love on us. But some of us just need to make that step and that decision to say, I want to enter into community. I'm going to take that step today. I'm going to do it. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us to find belonging within the arms of your church. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, Please remember, you belong at ACC.